Most of you know this Sunday as, or this reading that we have this morning from the Gospel as the... Anyone? What? Doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas. Right. We're going to uh, fix that misnomer this morning. Um, I don't think that that's necessarily a good name for this. But before we get to that point, let's talk about some other things. Is seeing believing? In most cases, I've heard, yes. If you see something, you can believe it. How many of you remember a TV show that was on a while, not too long ago, but a few years ago on A&E? Um, Chris Angel's Mind Freak. Did any of you ever see that? Nobody? I got one hand in the back, a couple hands back here. What was it about? It was a... Chris Angel was a... He's a magician. He's a person who does press the digitation, sleight of hand, right? And he did a bunch of tricks on the TV show that, and you saw him do it, but did it actually happen the way that it showed on the TV screen? Probably not. And let's go back even a little bit further. How about the, those of you sitting out here, how many of you remember David Copperfield? All right, now I get a few more hands, right? Because we, we all know who David Copperfield is, right? David Copperfield did a lot of things. Like, he made the Statue of Liberty disappear, right? Did the Statue of Liberty actually disappear? No, but it looked like it did. So we saw it, and we could believe that. But it didn't actually happen. So it's not actually true. One of the lines that came to my mind this morning as I was sitting back there listening to the readings is the line out of Santa Claus 2, the movie, right? Where, what's his, Steve's, not, yeah, Tim Allen, but his character in the movie, his son is explaining to the person who he's trying to get to marry him about the fact that, you know, it's all true and that you're not seeing things to believing. And the line is, seeing isn't believing. Believing is seeing. Right? Just because you see something doesn't mean that it's actually true. And just because you don't see something doesn't mean that it's not actually true. Right? Is our faith based on what we can see? Mine isn't. I don't know about yours. I hope that yours isn't. Mine is not because I can actually say I've never physically seen the risen Lord Jesus. Actually, that's a lie. Yes, tell me about it. It's a lie. You shouldn't do that, Pastor. Right, because actually I can, and I have seen Jesus. Where do I see him? I see him right there, and 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 there, and there, and there, and there, and there, and there. Everybody in here. When I look at you, hopefully I see Jesus. Right? It's not, but our faith is not based on what we have seen. Our faith is based upon what we have heard. We have not seen Jesus, but we've heard about Him. We've read about Him, right? In this book. This book. Not the kids' healthy recipes, but this book. We read about Him in this book, right? Here's a Jewish perspective on this story, understanding. Pinnich Lapid, a Jewish New Testament scholar, wrote... The resurrection of Jesus, a Jewish perspective. Now, I'll grant you, he is not a Christian. He doesn't claim to be a follower of Christ. He claims to be a Jew, and a Jew only. He is not Christian, yet he believes that God raised Jesus from the dead. For him, the proof of the physical resurrection lies in the changed lives of the disciples. And here's a quote from the book. When this scared, frightened band of apostles which was which was just about to throw away everything in order to flee in despair to Galilee, when these peasants, shepherds, and fishermen who betrayed and denied their master and then failed him miserably, suddenly could change overnight into a confident mission society, convinced of salvation and able to work with much more success after Easter than before Easter, then no vision or hallucination is sufficient to explain such a revolutionary transformation. According to this Jewish scholar, there's nothing more than the fact that Jesus had to rise from the dead 
to get these 11 guys to do what they did. Because they were all aware, according to our reading, before Jesus came to them. They were in a locked room. And why were the doors locked? They were afraid for their lives. Because what just happened to the guy they'd been following? He'd been hung up on a tree. So what's going to happen to me? Because I was following him. And I was doing what he was telling me to do. They're going to do the exact same thing to me. So they're locked away in an upper room, scared for their lives. They don't get it. But when they finally see it and understand that everything that he said before was true, they go, wait a minute. This is actually where the salvation lies. This is actually, everything he told us was true. So they change from being scared and afraid to being the most voiceless and outspoken people to go out into the world to do what God had called them to do. The biblical accounts here of what happened. Last week we heard Mary coming to the tomb and crying and weeping and not knowing Jesus when she saw Him, but then she saw Him and she went back to the disciples and said, I've seen the Lord. And she told them that He had said these things to her. Now, did the disciples believe her? Yes? No? Probably not, because where were they again? Back in the locked room, right? They still were behind the locked doors. They were locked in the room. And if they actually believed what Mary told them, then why would they still be in that locked room? John 25, John 20, 25. So the other disciples told Thomas, We have seen the Lord, but he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nail in his hands and touch his side where the sword pierced him, I'm not going to believe. Why does Thomas not believe unless he sees it? We call this passage the Doubting Thomas passage. And like I said a little earlier, I personally believe that that's not a good title. And I personally believe that Thomas gets a bad rap. Why? Because when Jesus first comes to the disciples in that locked room, who's not there? Thomas, where is he? We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. That's right. We have no clue as to where Thomas is at. I mean, we we have no, no idea where he's at. But he's not with the ten. He's not in that locked room. Now, he could be locked in another room all by himself, which would be really sad, right? Because now he's hiding and he's alone. He could be out in the streets. Maybe he heard what Mary said and he actually believed it. Of course, now he said what the other disciples said. It's probably not true. But we don't know where Thomas was. He wasn't with them. But he wasn't there. And then we get to that catchphrase in the Gospel, which gives us the name of Doubting Thomas. Jesus says to him, Do not doubt, but believe. And it's actually, Kai me gino apistos al apistos. Now, that's the, bridge, that's the Greek. That's not actually what Jesus said, because Jesus spoke Aramaic, so, you know. But, it's Kai me gino apistos al apistos. We get it translated, do not doubt, but believe. Here's the problem with this. It's apistos, but pistos. Allah is but. So we have apistos, and pistos. And pistos is one of the very first words that I ever learned in Greek. It was the one word that got my wife to never help me study Greek words ever again. I'll let you figure out why all on your own. But pistos is an interesting word. And the A part in there is interesting, right? The prefix A in pistos means... Not or without. It's just like English, right? If I tell you the word moral, and then I tell you someone is amoral, what does that mean? It means they are without morals, right? They don't understand it. They don't have morals. So, apistos means without pistos. So then we have to know what is pistos, right? Because, trust me, pistos does not have anything to do with doubt. It's far from it. Three possible listings for the definition of pistos are pertaining to trusting. 
Pistos is someone who trusts in something. Or it's pertaining to being trusted as in faithful or trustworthy or dependable or reliable. Or it means pertaining to being sure with the implication of being fully trustworthy. Pistos, I learned, means faith, trust, and belief. Not anything to do with doubt. It's not anything to do with doubt. So apistos could not have been doubt, but would be more not having trust, or not having faith, or not having certainty. Right? Jesus didn't say, don't doubt, but believe. Which leads to a question. Is it wrong to question God? How many of you have ever questioned God? You don't have to raise your hand. (laughs) I just want you all to make sure that you know that, yes, I have. Yes, I have questioned God. The biblical account shows us over and over again it's not wrong to question God. Biblical laments indicate that questioning God is a true and wonderful aspect of our faith. And in order to question something, we have to believe that that something exists. So if you're asking God why in the world something happened or what is going on, then you know what? You believe God is there and that God's going to do something about it. So no, it's not wrong for you to question God or to seek further truth or further certainty or further faith. Thomas's questioning is his desire to be sure, which is the meaning of pistos, right? Faith, trust, and belief. And this can be commended as a great and wonderful aspect of his faith in God. So, kai me gino apistos al apistos, do not doubt but believe, really should be, do not become unbelieving but believing. Do not become unfaithful but faithful. Do not become uncertain but certain. Right? Thomas seems to be here at this point in his life at a crossroads. When? What will he become? What is going to be the thing that describes him? Will he be trusting or not? Will he be faithful or not? Will he be certain or not? And how many of us have ever found ourselves at that crossroads going, okay, God, what's going to happen? Where are we going? We come to that point in time in our lives all the time. And it comes down to that same question. Are you going to be trusting or not? Are you going to be faithful or not? Are you going to be certain or not? See, Thomas gets the bad wrath of being the one who doubted, but Thomas is actually the only one in all of this passage that ever says who Jesus actually is. He's the only one that ever opens his mouth and confesses that Jesus Christ is his Lord and Savior. None of the other ten do that. Thomas is the only one. Are you ready to be like confessing Thomas and make the confession that Jesus is our Lord and Savior? And that we're certain in the fact that he went to the cross, that he died for us, that he laid in that tomb, and then he walked right out of it because he loved us and he wanted to give us a life with God. William Barclay says about this passage, There is more ultimate faith in a man who insists on being sure than the man who glibly repeats things which he has never thought out and which he does not really believe. It is doubt like that which in the end arrives at certainty. Thomas doubted in order to become sure. And when he did become sure, his surrender to certainty was complete. If a man fights his way through his doubts to the conviction that Jesus Christ is Lord, he has attained to a certainty that a man who unthinkingly accepts can never reach. See, it's not wrong for us to question our faith. It's not wrong for us to ask for certainty. It's not wrong when someone tells us, this is what we've always done. This is the way we should always do it. That's not what we're called to do. 
We're called to be thinkers and to be followers of God and to know why we do that. So don't be afraid like the disciples who were locked in that room because we have no reason to fear. Ask God questions. Seek understanding. Knock at the door and God will always be there to answer it. Live in the fact that Jesus came to go to the cross and to die for you. And now he's asking you to go with him and to go for him. Just as God sent me, so now I am sending you. We're not, not always sure of everything, and that's okay. We should be able to question and to seek understanding and to be His forgiveness to the world. So do not become uncertain but certain and live in the certainty of the cross. And do not become unfaithful, but be faithful, living in the faith given to you by the faithfulness of Jesus to go to that cross. And do not become unbelieving, but always be believing.